Labor Talks, recorded at Chippewa Valley Community Television in Eau Claire, Wisconsin. Hello and welcome to Labor Talks. Today's special guest, guest is Cal Christensen. Cal currently serves on the Dunn County Board of Supervisors and is also the president of Subchapter 63 of AFSCME Retirees. Welcome to Labor Talks, Cal. Glad Thank you could you. come. Yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, first of all, how about you tell us a little bit about you? Well, my folks moved from uh, Bruce to Dunn County in 1944. I was just a small child, don't remember much of uh, our life up in uh, Russ County. My dad farmed, had a herd of registered Holstein cattle. Uh, I went to the Dunn County Aggie School and graduated from there. I was the last, in the last class to graduate from there. I always joke about that uh, after I got graduated, they tore the school down and the university has got that property now. Uh, after, after I uh, got out of the high school, I joined the Navy in September to get my military obligation out of the way before I decided to settle down. I, I belonged to uh, three different labor unions in, in my life. Uh, when I got out of the Navy, I worked at Santa Dairy's, a dairy plant there in Menominee, for four years. As a, that was a Teamsters local. Then I went and worked uh, a year in Sturgeon Bay in the shipyard. Oh, and wow. was uh, in an electrical union over there. My dad passed away, and I come back and helped my brother on the farm for a while. And then uh, my mother sold the farm. And I went to work for the Dunn County Highway Department for 32 years. Belonged to AFSCME all those two years, but uh, I was probably more active in AFSCME than I was in the other unions. Uh, I guess at that time I, I didn't realize how important unions were. And uh, I, I certainly got an education with, uh, with the Public Employees Union with AFSCME in, in the highway department there. And how important it is. AFSCME tends to be one of the more politically active unions as a public yes. employees union, and it's good that they are. Can you explain the makeup of the AFSCME retirees? Well, AFSCME retirees, uh, we just went through a change in, in Wisconsin here now. Uh, before we were Chapter 7, uh, and that was uh, the state employees and the county municipal employees. And then there was Chapter 48, which was uh, in Milwaukee. Milwaukee County. And that was in Milwaukee County and the city. Uh, there was two different locals there, or two different entities. They, they belonged to Chapter 48, Chapter, or Council 48, and uh, the state employees were Council 24, and uh, county, county municipal employees were outside of Milwaukee County was Council 40. And last fall, or this spring, they, they uh, merged into Council 32. And then they, this fall, now, uh, the retirees went into Chapter 32. And it uh, includes all that were in Chapter 7 before, plus uh, Milwaukee County joined us. And so we, we've got a, f a founding convention and just had our first uh, election of officers in that, in uh, council, or chapter 32. And y uh, where do you hold your meetings for your subchapter 63? Uh, right now we're holding them in Barron. When I, when I first uh, retired, they are holding them in uh, Cameron. And there were some people I didn't really like the, facilities we had there. So then we moved to Barron, or talked to Barron and found a restaurant there that would, had a room that we could be a little more private in and uh, so we, so we could, have it there. So you could have more fun there, right? And yeah. Inter interrupting other people. <laughs> what issues are the ASME retirees fighting for today? Well, I th basically the same as we did when we were uh, working uh, with the, our, our councils when I when I know when I was working for uh, the highway department, 
We're still interested in, in labor issues. We're also uh, insurance, health insurance, and uh, retirement pensions. Uh, I don't know if you've heard or read about that, but uh, Senator Hansen from Green Bay is working on basically the same kind of uh, retirement system the state employees have for private sector employees. And uh, different ones are saying, you know, that we got the Cadillac plan. Actually, what we pay into our retirement is basically the same as what we pay into Social Security. And for some reason, the, the money I get or my pension from the state employees or, or state pension plan is higher than my Social Security. And I paid into Social Security longer than I paid into Your my state, state employee pension. Well, I know I get the legislative reports from, from ASME, and I know every year you get uh, we get notification that you know that money's sitting over there and it looks so nice and tempting to the to, to our government that they want to keep messing with the uh, Wisconsin retirement system just like they have tried to mess with Social Security. Um, how is that fight going? Well, I, I think it's still a very strong fight, but for some reason they've they've kept it kind of quiet and and when they keep it quiet, I I'm concerned about that because that's when. Uh, with the governor we have now, it seems like when he says he isn't going to do something, you can count that it is bet being that done. that's going to be something that they do. And uh, with the highways and that needing the money for infrastructure, they, they want to take some of that away from uh, the federal money from local units of government and uh, put to the state. So if, if he's going to do that, looks to me like they're going to go after our pension yet, and we got to we got to see that they don't do that. Well, and what amazes me when you talk to a younger person is there, or, or someone who isn't union and doesn't understand our union system, and they're like, well, we pay into our pensions, why wouldn't they? And it's like, you did. And it's like, oh, but they, like you said, oh, they got the Cadillac plan. You gave up dollars per hour to, in order to put it into your benefits. And now they're going to say, okay, well, now we're going to cut our benefits. I don't see them coming back and offering you the payback. That you lost. I, I've uh, I've mentioned that to several people that uh, at, on our at our county board too. I said, now are you going to raise the employees' wages up because we gave up a raise to get the county to pay their part, and it saved the county money by doing that actually because they weren't paying in. That money was paid in before they had to pay our pay social security. security. So, uh, and they were paying social security on. The, smaller wage for us so it, it saved money for the county but they they don't want to recognize that I, I don't know I mean Wisconsin the was the, reti the retirement railroad mm -hmm. system is different yet because they don't get Social Security no. where you get Social Security and your retirement uh, some some of the fire d uh, departments are, are that way too the firemen they, they uh, get a higher pension but they don't draw Social, social security. security. Of course, a lot of those guys have, have taken second jobs in, uh, on their days off and work part-time somewhere else so they get some credit for Social Security, too. Well, and unfortunately, I've talked to several firemen, and I know that their, their deductibles have gone higher and higher and higher. <laughs> it's like $7,500 for a family for a deductible on, on some of the different fire departments, and that's unheard of. I mean, no. that's a lot of money out of someone's pocket every year. Yes, so. it is. How did Act 10, the Act 10 legislation, affect the retirees? Uh, well, it, it made our numbers grow real fast. <laughs> uh, I, otherwise, it, it, it really hasn't affected us, as you know, except that, uh, like I say, a lot of people decided to take Early uh, retirement. Early retirement. And uh, now with the university system going through with the cuts that they've had, you know, they, a lot of the faculty in that are retiring. Uh, none, I don't think any of them are probably uh, AFSCME retirees, but, but it is putting uh, retirees, adding to the retirees. It, so it's also uh, making uh, his employment look better. 
Well, I know that, um, for instance, in Eau Claire, they, they lost several full-time positions uh, that were not faculty. They didn't let, and no, there weren't any cuts to the LTEs, but they were to the, to the limited term employees, but there were cuts to the full-time. Those people should end up being, um, if they were close to retirement age, would obviously come to you. If they're younger, like you said, they're gonna yeah. have to find another job. And the dues check off, that affected you guys, didn't it? Where they couldn't take the dues anymore as an annual check off to come right directly to you. Well, that, and then not only that, but uh, you know, we couldn't negotiate wages or our or conditions of employment or anything. They basically, they took all that we negotiated for before away. So you're paying for what? And, and that's what most of them say. You can't do nothing for me, so why should I? Why should I pay dues? Yeah, with this governor, we've gone one step forward, 50 steps back, instead well, of the old I, saying, <laughs> or more. I, I said they're back into the 19th century instead of the 20th century. Now, as a member of the Dunn County Board of Supervisors, what issues is Dunn County looking at as a, as a concern? Well, one of the things in, uh, we're looking at is uh, how they took away so much that the county used to regulate, like uh, your setback ordinances and that, with the lakes that we have in, in Dunn County, Tainer and, and Monoman, that are so polluted that uh, fortunately for all the rain we had this year, they, they were pretty good this year because it kept, it kept, kept them flushed out. Kept the phosphorus levels down. Uh, it, we, now we, we can't uh, have rules stricter than what the state has got. And if and they're talking about relaxing them more and taking uh, the DNR out of uh, may, having to do any permitting for uh, lakes and, and streams and that. And we had setback ordinances set that I wasn't really pleased with, but it went through. Uh, and it's probably good for for the lakes. But we uh, like uh, city of Menominee. We couldn't do anything with them. They they have their own own rules in that, so uh, they weren't affected by the setback ordinances that the county had put in okay. place. And now we had to undo those. So it's going to be a wait and see what what happens with our lakes. Well, and uh, several years ago, I attended a listening session with then Senator Russ Feingold, and it was in I met him with him in Dunn County. And many of the attendees brought up the high phosphorus levels, the pollution levels in those lakes. Um, the, how is the battle going, other than the fact that the rain has helped flush it, I mean? Yeah, well, I know, I, like I say, they've, they've tied our hands on, on being able to do any setback and that to try and keep phosphorus and, and a lot of the pollution, the, the runoff going into the lakes. Uh, they are doing some uh, retention ponds uh, it, the county made a, a switch, or not really a switch, but gives some land to the city to uh, put a retention pond on by our rec park, and that and that drained a lot of the the water from the city uh, homes, and that will go into that before it goes into the lake. It's into the lake. So it, it should it should be of some help there too. The um and it's just, it's more than to the two lakes though, isn't it? Yeah, Lake Tainer is, is north of Menominee. North of Menominee. And, uh, yeah, and that, uh, the county has been doing a, a lot of work on that for a number of years uh, with the farm runoff in that. And I think it's helped some, but, you know, there's probably so much that's on the bottom of the lake that uh, mm -hmm. until until that gets cleaned out or whatever, you're, you're going to have problems with well, it. When I know one of the things that was brought up at that same meeting was talking about uh, not dredging it, but where you bring in the machines, like the farm equipment machines that come oh, through and try yeah. to get those weeds out of the lakes. Um, have they been doing that? The, the, uh, our mayor, Knack, and uh, another person, I don't remember who that was, they, they built a machine for taking some of that off, but I don't know if it was because of the way this summer was. I didn't hear anything about him using that this year. This year. Well, I met with Russ Feingold about a month ago, 
And uh, we, he brought that up, but he wanted to know if that was still an issue. So if it is still a big issue in Don County, you should yes, contact yeah. Russ and talk to He wanted to talk about it with someone. So mm -hmm. um, I'm sure he would like to hear from you on that. Um, now you worked, you said, for the Dunn County Highway Department. What can you tell me about the infrastructure of Dunn County's highways and bridges? Are they doing enough to keep the highways and the bridges safe? Well, I think, you know, they, they've always been short of money on, uh, on roads. We've got some out my, one road that they just rehabbed in my area uh, that the last time that it was paved before before they did it last, I think it was last year that they did, paved it, was uh, probably about 50 years ago. And it was, it was patched, it was, it was maintained with patches, but it was patches upon patches. Patches upon and, uh, patches, which makes it very rough. Yeah, you don't, you don't get them down as good as, as new pavement. And I come into town on I-94, because I live in St. Croix County, and come into Eau Claire where my office is. And of course, the Knapp Hill is always wonderful in the wintertime. But the uh, bridges, the overpass bridges in over the river in Menominee, that was one of the first ones in our area that I think they determined is fracture critical and started to work on them. After the semi went through in between, mm -hmm. and then down into the river. Um, how, but I swear, then the next year around, they're back working on it again. How is that holding up? Well, it, I think it seems to be holding up real well. I haven't, haven't heard anything on it. There's nothing that's come to to us on the county board member, and I'm not uh, on the county board level, and the committee, highway committee has never mentioned anything about them having Any problems, problems with, with it. it. But they rebuilt both those bridges. Right. And uh, then they did put a bike lane bridge across to underneath the, the one, I think it's the southbound lane. Have you heard anything more about the possibility of 94 going three lanes both ways? Yeah, I've heard heard rumors of that, and uh, they they are building the bridges now, so that they're wider. Because I they're, noticed they're wider, that yeah. that bridge was built wider. They're they're built to accept the the third lane, and uh, I think it's a wise thing. It, when they first built it, they they done it like uh, a lot of the government projects. They built it as cheap as they could. I always said that uh, before when they when they built it. Those bridges should have been the same width as what the shoulders were. So when you're plowing snow, you had to come in there and and either try and move over. You know, you couldn't stay in your lane like you were when when you're plowing the, the main highway. You had to, especially if you had a wing on, you either had to raise that up or make sure there was nothing coming so you could get over a little farther to uh, get through the bridges. Get through them. Well, I know that, um and I don't, maybe it's just my personal perception, but again, coming from where I live to here, yeah. the majority of the accidents that I see in the wintertime are right through Menominee. You know, through that, and there's always cars rolled over in the median. And is there a reason why that particular stretch is so dangerous? I, not that I know of, you know. I, and I, uh, when I was working, I, I plowed snow on 94 in the wintertime, usually at the, on the night shift. and. Uh, you know, why, why they were having so much trouble there, I, I really don't, don't know. know. And, and when it comes to pre-treating, when they know a big storm is coming and they get out and they try to pre-treat the highways, um, are we using brine in Wisconsin? Yes. And is that working really well? I, I never had a whole lot of experience with it. I, I, I don't know, but it seems, I know they pre-treat the, the bridges, which seem to freeze over first, you know. First. And, and that seems to, I think, help. Because they're going to need to be right up on the system and and how it works. Because if they're going to keep this as a seventy mile stretch, seventy mile an hour stretch, then you know there's people that are going to believe they can go that seventy miles no matter how bad the roads are. So it's, what are they doing to to uh, make sure that the road condition is going to stay so that you can do the viable speeds? Well, and I guess there's there's really no way you can really you can really do that. And these people that got a four wheel drives think that uh, <laughs> I'm you know, one of them <laughs> but, but I, I don't think that you think because I got four-wheel drive I can I can always do the speed limit no yeah I, <laughs> I've been on the highway enough to know you can't always go the you, speed uh, limit yeah and, and, and there's it gives some of them a false sense of security with that well I got four-wheel drives so 
I don't I have to worry wherever about I want, it. however I want to go. Yeah. I can't do that. Um, a question again for the retiree side of it. One of the things that I've noticed with getting active with the, the other unions in politics and coming up election time is that there is a, is a set of retirees out there that are like, well, I'm retired now, I don't care anymore, I've got my stuff. What can we do to get them to stay active so they can teach the younger people what the, why the union movement is there? I, you know, I, that's a good question and I don't know the answer to it. But I, I've always, I've said before, even when I was working, that there's an awful lot of these younger guys, people that need something like Act 10 to realize that all this stuff isn't guaranteed, that it's a right to have, that you got to work for right. it, you got to fight for it, and... Uh, a union contract isn't an entitlement. They need right. to understand that somebody fought for them to have that. You know, I met with, um, or listened to Joe Gruber speak once, uh, the former state mm -hmm. president of the, of the uh, AFL-CIO, and he t mentioned how he perceived that a young person just going to work, that very first week of work should have no contract. Then the next month, let them go with the very first contract that was ever ratified, and then the next one, and the next one, until they're up to the contract that, that they have now. And maybe then they'd understand, and you wouldn't have these young kids come and saying, what is a union doing for me? Yeah, I, I don't know, I, that sounds like it'd be a good idea. But I mean, yeah. I, w I know that I would like to have <coughs> more of the retirees come and teach, even speak uh, to a, a, the younger kids, the next wave, and the, because I know Ask Me is pretty good with the next wave groups, um, to teach them, this is what we did. This is what, how we are, where we are today, and what's really been detrimentally done to our state in the last four years. Well, you know, and one thing, and I don't know if, if they've done it, uh, there was a move to have uh, labor history taught in our schools. And I don't think that there's really a, a curriculum for that. And uh, you maybe have got it. I br did bring over an email that I got on labor history aesthetic essay contest that uh, high school kids can participate in. And I'm gonna take it down to our high school and uh, show it to them and, and see if they're interested. But, uh, and if anybody, if, you, if I can have it, sure. if anybody would like a copy of this, we have it down at the Labor Hall too. This is the Labor History Essay Contest. Win cash prizes up to $500 for essays, essays of about 750 words on the topic. Unions have been important to my family and my community because, um, and this is a great way to get the younger people involved. I did help judge one year at OUW Eau Claire at the uh, regional um, history contest that these kids do. <laughs> they can either do a speech, they can do an essay, they can do a project. And we were in there specifically looking for projects that were union oriented, that had something, you know, like the t-shirt you know, the, the, mm -hmm. the different types of things that have gone on. Um, and some years we've given away the prizes, some years we have not. And like you said, it's supposed to be being taught in schools right now, but these kids aren't doing them as their projects, so it's, they're not getting active and, in, and interested in the union movement early enough. Well, and I think, uh, and I, don't, I don't know, if, and maybe they are doing it, but, but I think uh, the schools, should try and get some retired union members to come and into talk. school and talk to the, the students. Especially if they're unions that are in the area of that school. Yes. And if I was a teacher, I would want my kids to know that there's a possible another scholarship if you're going if you do your project on, on you know, labor history. There were projects on Ford Motor Companies, but they never mentioned the union. There were projects on the different types of things like that, like tires, but they never mentioned Uniroyal and the rubber workers. It would be nice to see that yes. being well, done. Well, you know, I, and I don't know if, if you've uh, read about that, I think it was the gold battery strike here in Eau Claire, and where they called the governor to bring the National Guard the up to protect the plant. It wasn't to protect the... The no, workers. Not protect the and workers. and uh, that's the way it's been in so many places. The the union or the companies get the protection of, of the government to protect their their interests 
and we don't worry about the employees. And that's another thing that's affected AFSME in the last couple of years, and that's yes. Walker had the National Guard ready to step in if the corrections had gone on strike, if they had gone out on blue flu, as a way for him to try to get to privatize our prisons. And I know a lot of the construction uh, or uh, corrections officers have pulled out of AFSME and are forming their own group, and it's mm -hmm. kind of a shame to see one of the strongest public unions in Wisconsin has taken such a major hit under Walker. Yeah, and uh, it's surprising too. They they took the guards off from the the third shift because I guess they figure the prisoners at dark at night they wouldn't they wouldn't try to escape. Then they they do it in daylight. When do they escape? They usually escape at night, don't they? <laughs> um, what do you see as a way forward for our unions today? I think I think it's going to take a little more of. Uh, the Walker style, taking things away from employees that they they thought they had an entitlement to, for them to wake up and they find hit, out. They're gonna hit rock bottom first, right? Yes. If they hit rock uh, bottom, then maybe they can understand that it's they need to start fighting. They, uh, you know. And they, we need to work together. Yes. Instead of being concerned about, uh, well, he's making more money than I am, or she's making well, more. And his benefits are better than mine. Yes. In fact, my wife was making more money than I was, but I didn't complain about that. Uh, my husband's a robotics machinist. I don't complain about it either. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Cal, I want to thank you for coming. The program yeah. today um, couldn't work if we didn't have people that were willing to volunteer and come so we can talk to you. Um, my thanks also to those working behind our cameras and to our v viewing audience at home. And the, the cameras in the station here, they not only do a great job doing the show, but they give us our outlet to our union yeah. voices so that we can be heard. Um, a, a part that I don't feel we're getting out in the rest of the media. Um, and a final note, Labor Talks is on channel 993, twice weekly, and you can also use your favorite search engine um, with keywords Labor Talks and CVC TV, and you can find us also on YouTube. Um, and thank you for joining us today. Chippewa Valley Community Television is made possible by continuing community support. If you would like to volunteer or make a donation, you can contact us by calling 715-839-5067 or on the web at www.cbctv.org.